nation's strength is found in many places, in its schools and its churches, in factories and on farms, in its youth and in its senior citizens. Its strength can be seen and measured in its military might. And its strength can lie unseen and unmeasured in the national character of its people. In times of trouble, three great symbols of America's strength have always emerged. First, the unity of all groups in facing a common danger. Second, the ability to turn industrial capacity on full blast to supply the tools to meet the emergency. And third, the less publicized, less glorified ability of the modern farmer to provide enough food to keep us healthy, strong, and growing during years of peace and war. During World War I, when we first felt the true importance of food as a weapon for peace in the modern world. In World War II, the Korean conflict. And in all the tragedies of famine round the world, when we... Today, America is hard pressed to maintain its position in the world. But there are those who quietly, but forcefully say, American agriculture might well be our most important strength in the struggle for a true peace. Tremendous scientific advances have been made in other fields, overseas, and in America. But in agriculture, America has not only retained its leadership, but has forged ahead in its ability to produce more and better food. This ability to feed a growing nation, and to do it with the fewest number of farmers in history, is an achievement that frees millions of others to work in areas where we need greater strength. In America, one farmer can feed 26 people. 26 who are free to work in all the other jobs that contribute to a strong economy. In this Asian country, it takes many farmers to feed just one city person. In this country, industry suffers because one farmer can grow food only for himself and one or two others. That's why other countries welcome American missions when their purpose is to provide information about our agriculture. And that's why this man spent a long time on his visit to the United States looking carefully at our ability to produce food. Russia needs 47% of its workers on the farm. One man on the farm to feed one man in the city. That's why in 1961 Mr. Khrushchev told his countrymen to eat horse meat and grow American hybrid corn. That's why many visitors from other countries, not behind the Iron Curtain, our allies in the Cold War, are deeply interested in American agricultural techniques. Americans in general, well-fed and contented, tend to take for granted the food on the table. But the leaders of other countries know full well that the balance of power in the long run can very well lie with the country best able to feed its people and its friends. So today, the American farmer who successfully fed his own country and the Allies through two world wars is emerging as the man who is giving his country a strong advantage in the struggle for peace. What makes this man so different from the farmer in some other countries? Behind the modern farmer of the 60s is a quarter of a century of the greatest progress ever known in agriculture. Perhaps the greatest scientific progress ever made in such a short time. If we farm today with the same use of labor we had 25 years ago, we'd need 17.5 million more farm workers than we now have. And we would need more than twice as much cropland as we used then. But to get a true picture of the development of agriculture, Let's go back 100 years. 
President Lincoln had just created the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the land-grant colleges, the two most significant acts of the past century insofar as man's ability to defeat famine. The U.S. Department of Agriculture was to become the center of research into new and better ways of producing food. And the land-grant colleges were to turn over by the tens of thousands the trained men and women whose lives were dedicated to the job of farming and helping the farmer. One hundred years ago, power had not yet come to the farm. Animal and human muscle cultivated the land and grew the crops for a hungry, growing country. One farmer could feed only five people in 1860, and millions were needed on the land just to grow food for themselves and the rest. By 1900, after steam power came to the farm, it still took one farmer to feed seven people. But the ability of the farmer to grow more food for more people was beginning to release the first flood of manpower to industry. The movement of manpower from farm to factory is one of the greatest single reasons for America's fantastic industrial growth in the first half of the 20th century. At the start of World War II, the American farmer had pretty well replaced animal with tractor power. Doing so, he had increased the number of persons he could feed to 11, freeing millions more that were needed now not only for industry, but for the armed forces. But many of these farming operations still required the costly labor of extra hired hands. In 1939, for instance, it took two or three men to run this hay baler, one man on the tractor, and one or two on the baler to tie off the wire. But that same year saw one of the first major advances in automatic farm equipment. The one-man baler appeared on the scene, just in time to help harvest the hay that fed the livestock during World War II. Quietly, without fanfare, the resources of government, college, and industry were turned to scientific ways of producing more and better food at less cost and with less labor. Here's how the man of agriculture did it. He replaced animal power with machines and electricity. He mechanized field work like haymaking to the point where one man could do the job. He put in assembly lines in his barn operation. He used the best devices of chemistry to fertilize, kill weeds and pests. And to get healthier animals. He improved the varieties and yield of his crops. He began to stop the land from blowing and washing away, and to use each acre according to its best potential. Through all this, the family farm began to emerge, and more farmers owned their lands instead of being tenants or sharecroppers. Better roads brought the food closer to the market, and fresher food to the tables. As millions left the farm for the factory, the man on the farm found new ways to make sure his neighbors in the city could depend on having an abundance of food in the greatest quantity and selection ever known to mankind. That's why there's only one man on the farm for every 26 people in this picture. That's why the rest of the nation is free to work in business and in industry, in government and in public service, without worrying where the next meal is coming from. That's why in America, a lower percentage of income is spent on food than in most any other country in the world. Latest figures in the Department of Agriculture show that 22% of income is spent on food in the United States, while 36% is needed for food in Austria, 30% in Belgium, 32% in France, 39% in Ireland, 45% in Italy, 32% in the Netherlands, 30% in Norway, 
and 27% in Sweden. If you lived in Moscow, you'd work four times as long as a New York City worker to buy a quart of milk. In France, you'd work 155 minutes to buy a pound of beef sirloin. But in the United States, the average worker earns the money in 30 minutes. A loaf of bread would cost you 13 minutes of work in West Germany and only five minutes of work in the United States. In a country where the great mass of people can depend on a few for their food, business and industry are free to develop to the point where the great majority of people are well-educated, well-housed, well-clothed, well-cared for, and able to enjoy a full life. By contrast, in March 1962, Nikita Khrushchev warned the people of Russia that failure to increase farm production will confront the country with great difficulties. Khrushchev told of Russia's serious shortage of food, especially meat, and said Russia must increase the manufacture of farm machines and encourage farmers to make better use of them. One of the greatest speakers of America today, Calvin Johnson, former congressman from Illinois, has been telling America for years that food can be our weapon for peace. I know what we can do with food in a world where there are hungry people. Building goodwill among the people of the world is as important as manufacturing guns for their defense. The American farmer with his amazing ability to produce all the food we need and the best food has given us one of the strongest balances of power that exists in the world today. On July 1st, 1961, the Saturday Evening Post said, a surplus of food is one Cold War weapon which the communists do not have. Moreover, it is going to be an ever more important asset in the future. Charles E. Palm, Dean of the College of Agriculture of Cornell University says, America's great strength in agriculture, which is beyond doubt the envy of the communist world, will continue to be a powerful weapon for peace. In the history of this country, the man behind the plow has many times become the man behind the gun as we fought for freedom. Today, the man on the farm stands bigger than ever, right there where he is now, on the farm. He is perhaps our strongest factor in the never-ending quest for peace.